This is the Distinctly Detroit Podcast, the only pod that explores why one wants to be in the D. I am your host, Fiota Ship III, the director of the University of Michigan Detroit Center. Join me as I interview students, scholars, leaders, and innovators about living, working, and loving in Detroit. Welcome back to the Distinctly Detroit Podcast. On today's episode, we have the founder of Detroit is Different. He earned his BBA in marketing and master's in marketing from Walsh College. In addition to leading Detroit is Different as a podcast and digital publication, he also is the founder and CEO of a marketing company called Creative Differences. Uh, What began as a career as a performer, producer, and promoter has led him to an even broader entrepreneurial adventure that we are going to explore today. The DDP welcomes Kari Frazier. Welcome to the show. What's going on, my brother? Thank you. Nice to see you today. Glad to have you on board. Mm -hmm. Um, So where did you grow up? Oh, man, uh, 12th Street, 1-2, like uh, that whole pocket. I say Davidson, Linwood, uh, you know, that area now, I guess the CDC is Hope Village Revitalization, but you know, I think of it like the 12th Street neighborhood, and that was the richness that so much pours out of. We moved eventually over to like Russell Woods, but stayed in the same zip code, 48238, other than when I was truck driving for a stint for a couple of years in my life. Oh, okay, truck driving, we didn't find that in the, in the research. Hilarious. Okay, where'd you go to high school? Northwestern, the big N.O. is where I ended at. I started at King High School. And as they say, like the nerd program, math, science and applied technology. I wasn't I wasn't checking for that. But uh, ended at Northwestern. Uh, the mighty, mighty Colts love Northwestern. OK, so in the course of our research, we learned that uh, again, you kind of you started out as an inter- in entertainment mm-hmm. and you dropped an album called Preaching to the Choir. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you tell us more about your life as W.A.E.? Okay, so working at Excellence, uh, jumping around, as I used to say, like jumping around on stages, yelling at people with a microphone, hip hop, uh, that was the pervasive form of communication that just connected to me as a young man. I really felt the hip hop connection, what it meant to me at the time, uh, being born in 82, I'm looking at these different types of black men as figures, uh, saying what they want to say in my mind, doing what they want to do in their mind. different looks of black men. So hip hop just hit a chord with me and many other people, you know what I'm saying? A lot of people have rapped and dropped rhymes and stuff, but it connected me to even get more creative. And uh, Preaching to the Choir was a project that I did. I wanna say that was 2007. And it was from the lens of a lot of the revolutionary work. So like Public Enemy, uh, you could think about Brand Nubian a little bit, but also, you know, I love the Ghetto Boys. So like a little bit of Scarface influence and Ice Cube being one of my favorite rappers of all time. So Cube is in there, Pac is in there. Like all those influences play out on that album a lot more aggressive, I think. And just a feel that was very fun to get a chance to offer that to the public and those that got it. Hey, it's special because I don't even know if I still have it up for release like that. Okay. So how did you come up with the name Working at Excellence? Well, at first it was like different ways to rap. So like way. And then I'm like, okay, nah, let's make this an acronym. Uh, my cousin Ray, Ray Leon Johnson, spells his name R-A-E. So I was like, okay, let's change this to W-A-E. So that was just kind of the play off of it. And then as I really took that on, I really didn't recognize what it would mean just so much more in life. Like if I can work towards excellence and what my standard of excellence is, I believe I get better results at everything else in life. That's dope. That's dope. So you've been in the hip hop since 2002 mm-hmm. and then you made the decision to establish your own businesses. Mm-hmm. Uh, Detroit is different and Creative Differences Inc. Can you take us back to what made you switch out of the the entertainment side to being your own front man of, of your own businesses? Well, I'm gonna take it back like it was running concurrent at one point in time. So okay. um, uh, shout out to Theo Broughton and Hood Research. Uh, Hood Research is a group that does a lot of different, I would say activism and uh, cost actions and things. And I wanna say in 2000, maybe in 2000, or maybe 99, they used to do a black businesses on parade where they would almost start like right here at this corner, like Mac and Woodward 
all the way up to Grand Circus Park. Uh, and with that parade, they were like, hey, can you design a logo for us? And it was the first time somebody like just saw what I was playing around with, like Microsoft art and asked me to do something. And I said, yeah, I guess I can do that. So I did that and they put it on T-shirts. They put it on like a banner. They put it on a flag. I was like, wow, this is really cool. And it, in the logo, Lord knows. I mean, I did my best to show a dollar transitioning seven times in the black community because that's the idea that if a dollar can stay in the black community for seven transactions, you're creating wealth. So that was the concept. And I was like, okay, conceptually, what did I do? So I like made one black hand to the next black hand with some dollars, the next black hand with another dollar and so forth and so on. And then put their logo in the middle or put the initials in the middle. So after that logo, it was in the back of my mind. I'm like, what is this? Somebody's like, this is marketing. So then I took a marketing class at uh, Northwestern. And um, from there, I was in DECA. I don't know if people know DECA. The DECA is like this group of marketing for kids and stuff. And I excelled in that. But that's where I kind of left it for a while. Uh, just doing the hip hop stuff. But people kept pulling me over saying like, hey, can you do a logo? Can you do a flyer? Uh, can you help us with this event? And I'm like, this is all in the marketing suite. So let's take some classes in marketing. Uh, let's let's do something different. Uh, when I hit that wall, late twenties, you know, between how do I sustain myself? Where are things going? I'm about to be thirty. I think I may want to consider marriage if I have a kid. W what will hip hop look like if I'm here in Detroit? I was like, let's at least take another consideration at things. That's where let's get some education in marketing and learn some other things and. Since then, it's definitely not the easiest path ever, but I feel it's been blending in both. So creatively, I can express things the same way that I would look at making a song, but now I work with the client the same way. We sit back, we brainstorm. I hear the vision of where they want to go. And similar to like when I do songs with my friends, it's like, okay, this is what you're working on. This is what you're doing. How do I approach this? What's creative about this? And that's where the fun and passion comes to life. Okay. So what do you find to be the biggest challenges in running your own businesses? Okay, well, naturally, it always comes to, I need more money, but <laughs> <laughs> beyond more money, like if I really go back and look at it from a more macro sense, it is, it's finding the clients that really want to be creative. So that means I have to challenge myself to have more creativity. I think the difference between me and a lot of my other contemporaries in this field are like marketing and content creation. Uh, a lot of them usually go to a client and say, hey, this is what you need to do. This is what everybody else is doing. You need a TikTok page. You need a Twitter page. You need a blah, 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 blah. That's not my approach. My approach is I feel that the creative difference we offer is I know all these creatives. I've been working with creatives for a long time. And for anybody that's worked with rappers, you know, working with rappers are maybe the toughest brand of creatives to work with, right? So I want to find that client that's more willing to try something new, try something out the box, and then let's create and bring that to life together. So the difficulty is actually thinking more out the box myself. I have to have an active portfolio. And that's what Detroit is different is. I have to have an active portfolio of things that I love to do working with other creative people that is very creative, that stands out. And people say, I don't know how you did this and why you did this, but I want to do something like this. And that's when it's like, I got the perfect client. Until then, sometimes, you know, you just got to do the Sanders stuff. People say, look, I know what I want. I just want a flyer. I just want a t-shirt. Or I, I, you know, can you just come moderate this event? Which that's cool too, but that's not going to really spark my passion. And I think that I'm best when I, when you spark my passion. So along this journey, knowing that it may take some patience and due diligence, but get as creative as I possibly can get and be patient enough with people to show them that if we can tap into that creativity, we're going to tap into something different with everybody that connects to it. Okay. Um, it's like you anticipate my questions. I ain't sharing with you in advance, but Hilarious. what have you found to be the most rewarding aspect of your journey so far? Uh, the people, the people. I mean, it's weird, too, because that's also sometimes the, the toughest thing in the journey, too, is the people. But uh, people's response, especially black people, uh, our culture and our creativity, it, it, it oozes in abundance. You know, you just never see how 
people may respond to something or or connect to something. And it's it's always a trip just seeing that person that, you know, um, I'm sure you get this with this podcast. Like, you know, somebody that you never would expect to listen or check out or appreciate something comes up to you and is like, yo, I love that episode or I love that song. Like one of my biggest fans is one of my classmates uh, for music. One of my biggest music fans is one of my classmates I just did not expect to come in my when I was getting my master's in marketing at uh, at Walsh College and in Walsh is very conservative um but I like that from the lens of uh, American business but um she she is a manager of a credit union actually a couple credit unions and like you would just think that like this white lady would be like at a hip hop show and know the lyrics, even sometimes when I don't know the lyrics. So sometimes it's those connections that throw things off. Like, wow, that's interesting. I didn't expect people to have that response. Okay. Um, you, we, you touched upon it a little bit. We didn't get explored, but uh, you have creative difference marketing mm -hmm. and then you have the Detroit is different podcast. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tell us about the Detroit is different podcast. All right. First off, great show when you were a guest on the show Thank and that was yes. fun. Yes. Um, I've been on another podcast. It was great opportunity. Fun. I had a good time. <laughs> it was, yeah, it's yeah. always cool sometimes when you sit um, in that mic and I feel like with Detroit is different, it started really as a platform for a way to market my album, If Detroit Were Heaven. That one's still available. So check wherever you download or listen to music. Check out If Detroit Were Heaven. I like some of the songs on there. Um, I hope so. And uh, <laughs> yeah, definitely. I made them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but sometimes you make something, you know, it don't be in the vibe. You yeah. know what I'm saying? But it's a good springtime vibe type album. Okay. Like that's the feel and the flow. Me and Lola Damone made some cool songs on there and others, but it's really cool. But uh, I wanted a platform to share the album. And I was already listening to so many podcasts and I like long form content. And I was like, okay, let's start this podcast thing. And this was way before many people even knew what a podcast was. They were just doing it because it's like, yeah, I'm cool with him. And I was like, let me introduce people to the differences in Detroit. So, all right, first off, anybody that's thinking about content creation, if you want to do content creation, I would strongly advise about taking the path that I took for it. I would pick something very niche, very specific, and become a subject matter expert on that. And that way it'll feed into the growth of content creation and probably monetizing faster. But I did it my own way. My way was I was sick of people saying they don't like this about Detroit or that about Detroit. And I'm like, damn, what Detroit do you live in? You know, I know the Detroit I live in. Do you see the differences that I see? And it being so clickish, I'm like, let me just take people on a journey through people I know. So that's where I ask people, like, how did their family get here? What's your relationship to Detroit? How do you connect to Detroit? How do other people respond? What are the places you went? What are the highlights? And that's what's so fun about it. Because I feel like as much as I'm interviewing who I'm interviewing, uh, Detroit and the Detroit experience is a like third person yeah. in the room as my style is usually people say, he'll cut people off and like, you know, I'll stop people and just give more context to some of the things that are being said during the podcast. Like during our podcast, we spoke a little bit about Devil's Night. We spoke a little bit about definitely the Bagley community yeah. and uh, that the type of community that was, especially in the 80s and what home ownership was over there and the homeowners that still exist over there. Yeah. And unlike other communities, like these are things I know that I think add to the culture of Detroit being what it is. Yeah. It's like almost the city is a guest in the room itself and mm -hmm. manifesting. Yep. So who've been some of your favorite guests that have come on your show? Or some um, shows you want to highlight? I would say like, let's see, favorite guests, favorite guests. I don't know if I would say favorite because I like them all even, and that's the thing about podcasting. I guess yeah. it's, um, it's, a, it's very cliche to say, I like everybody. Or, you know, or, just, or would you but say like some of the better out. conversations, you know, things that stood out to you or you're like, you know, wow, that really was a good conversation. So, so uh, I really liked uh, my conversation with Charlie Beckham. Uh, Charlie Beckham uh, working oh, in Detroit politics. Uh, a rich conversation with Charlie Beckham. Uh, I love my conversation with Coco. Coco is almost, uh, comedian Coco is like an auntie to me anyway you know, always has been open to working with and collaborating. That's why you see her with a lot of Detroit is different stuff. I kind of make her like honorary Detroit is different family. Yeah. And even 
even at worst, you know, she would just pull my coat like, hey, you shouldn't have did that. So that was a rich discussion. Uh, a- another very interesting discussion I, I had was with uh, entertainment attorney Howard Hertz, uh, also entertainment attorney uh, Gregory Reed. That was a rich discussion too. Um, it, it's It's been so many guests over time. I, I really like sometimes those stories from those people that you just don't think that they would ever be on a podcast. Those are yeah. sometimes the richest discussions. Um, and so many people, you know, I, I plan on interviewing so many more. We're at 389 episodes now. Oh, so, wow. You know, we'll get, we're going to reach that 400 goal soon. I got to get my weight up. got to catch Hilarious. you. <laughs> <laughs> we're nowhere near that. Uh, in our research, we found that your father, Greg Frazier, mm-hmm. is a um, certified public accountant. Yep. He started his own firm. Mm-hmm. And can, what have you learned watching your father run his own business? So much. Uh, Speaking of good podcasts, the discussion me and my dad have about um, so many other things. Just just check out podcasts between me and my dad. But um, I think that for my dad, I feel in this era of so much entrepreneurship being being, for lack of a better term, marketed to the general public as that's the way to go. I feel I have a competitive advantage over a lot of my other friends because I grew up in a household that was sustained through entrepreneurship. Uh, I, and it's a different lifestyle. Um, And I've gone through master's in business school. And I even tell the people at Walsh, and this is the type of big mouth that I have. It's like, this ain't business school, this employee school. But that's how a lot of these business schools are, you know, because Sometimes the things that you think would make sense don't make any business sense at, on, on earth. Like, here's a classic one. You send a proposal to a person. They see the price and all of that stuff. Business school will say, hey, stay on top of them. Make sure that they follow through. The best thing to do is send a proposal, wait a while. Yeah. Give them breathing room. They know they got it. They know the number. They know what's up. And then that way it kind of presents this whole era of uh, aura, I should say, of of scarcity that exists in the capitalist system of America. So the scarcity thing is like, damn, this person ain't even hit me back no more. You know what I'm saying? Because sometimes you'll get fidgety. You'll be like, damn, I think that was too much money. I charged them 2000 Maybe I need to go on and revise it and send it for 1500 I need to do this or I need to do that. Then the bottom becomes the floor. So meaning like you'll keep sending stuff back. Through my dad, I know, no, nah, you send that one time. You heighten that up. If they're serious, they'll pay. If they won't, they won't. And furthermore, if you go in for undercutting at 500, if you go from 2,000 to 1,500, then they're going to be like, why don't you just go on and go for 1,000? Why don't you just do it for 500? Because clearly you need the money. You know what I'm saying? So it's like science like this is not taught in business school. But I get it from my dad. All types of things with clients. You know what I'm saying? You know, sometimes, you know, it's been times where I remember one time a client paid me less than what was owed. So I can call my dad like, hey, what do you do? The client paid less. The What was owed was $700, but the client paid five. And then he was like, do you need the money? I was like, not necessarily. He was like, go back and take it back and tell him this was an error. So oh, I wow. went and I took yeah. it back. The, okay. he, the, the client wasn't there, the secretary was. And I said, this was an error, right? It changed the whole dynamics of the relationship. That These are the things me and my dad often talk yeah. about. So then the client was like, oh, man, you know, uh, that's all I got for you now. And then I can't get you the rest later. But now we at least had that conversation. Whereas yeah. if I'd have cashed that check, it would have been all good. He'd have probably been like, yeah, I'll get that too to you when I catch you. Or he'd have been like, you know, uh, maybe you can do this or that. He'd have got more work out of me for what was really owed. Yeah. But I got my dad to reach out to for so many other business things that I've dealt with, you know. And I often tell a lot of people, um, how do I come at this? I often tell a lot of people the other key advantage I've learned from my dad is the variable. You can't control how much is going to come in. You know, I know a lot of times people say, especially when the YouTube content world, it's like, oh, you want to have enough savings for, for five before a year if things break down. In reality... That's very, that's very far-fetched, especially depending upon the type of business you're in. My business, I got to use a lot of different people. I need new equipment. It takes up a lot of my time. So there's certain things I can do. But 
What I can really control is my expenses. Keeping a low overhead is very important. So you need people that buy into your low overhead. You can't have homeboys that's trying to go to the Super Bowl every year and go to the Super Bowl and be an entrepreneur. I don't care if that big check came because that big check may come now and it may not come for a long time. You know, um, you, you got to have if you're in a relationship, you got to have a, a spouse that really understands how cash flow works and where things go. And if I, I was you, I would settle with that car that I got or, or it's hopping the bus or, or going, you know, walking it out. Like even right now, I got a big event coming. My car is down. I'm not going to even think about a new car until after this event happens for multiple reasons, especially me. I do community work. You know, I pull up in a brand new car. And then I tell my client, I tell some of my team, hey, you know, the client pays out net 30, meaning it takes 30 days for the client to pay. That don't permeate well in, with the people I work with. Yeah. All they see is you got a new car. And then it may not even be my, my staff, my team, my contractor. It could be their spouse. And they hear like, hey, oh, where yeah. your money at? And they'd be like, you know, I'm going to get paid net 30. That's what he said. Net 30, but he got a new car. These are the things you got to always keep in mind and pay attention to. When you're making your business decisions on how you move, how you build your team, how you're going to uh, put that work in. And it really takes a lot of time. Like, I feel I'm just I feel like I'm just now getting in entrepreneurial middle school. sort of, And I've been doing this for 12 to 14 years. You know, it takes time. So you can't compare yourself to your friends that, you know that may be making six figures because they've been working their job for a couple of years or they're at that place in their professionalism. When you start that business, you're starting from year one. You're starting from year one. And, you know, I got those advantages from my dad. That's awesome, man. That's really awesome. Uh, your love of Detroit is palpable. <laughs> thank you, thank you. How has your journey with Detroit is different shaped or altered your perception of the city? Well, now it's to the point where I'm like interviewing some people that connect to the city a whole lot more too, but um, it, it runs concurrent with me growing too, you know, the 10 yeah. years. Um, so I would say I still love the city so much, but I see so many other parallels in other American cities now, even certain international cities. Uh, I still will say Detroit is going to be the best because that's just what we do here, you know, good water. But uh, as much as I'm saying that, Detroit is really like a, 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 a science experiment of the American industrial age at its best and the American industrial age at its worst. And the industrial age is really what spawned the whole concept of the romanticism of American lifestyles. The make America great again that Ronald Reagan was speaking of, and I guess to an extent, the former, our former President Trump kind of spoke to, but that the whole world was pervasively pushed out. You know, so this is like Lever to Beaver. Uh, happy days, uh, you, you know, the, the Americana 1950s lifestyle. 1950s America. Yeah, that is the industrial age of America. Um, Detroit was the place that was the heartbeat of that, you know? Uh, and now we're transitioning to a world of, first off, not so much the industrial age, but I guess in this information technology age, but we're also shifting to a day and age where the, the, the pervasive control of the economic resource of cash, oil, and, uh, and weaponry is kind of shifting from being so much in the square foot hold of America to other places. And watching that in Detroit from this lens, makes it so dynamic. It makes it it makes it very interesting because I think this is what's triggering new cultures, new lifestyles, new ideas, new creativity. Because the reason why many of our families came here, it just ain't here no more. Yeah. So what keeps us here is really just those sincere connections to the loved ones we have. So how do we just build community from something that was so built around industry? And 
That's what I'm seeing right now with Detroit is different. Mm-hmm. What do you want for Detroit? Oh, man. <laughs> That's a heavy question. I like it, though. What do I want for Detroit? What I would like to see for Detroit is the opportunities for Detroiters to feel we can reach the quality of life that we would like to attain. Uh, I love my neighborhood. I love my block. But I'm also cognizant of the fact that there's certain people that are in my neighborhood and in my community that feel trapped there. Trapped because of lack of opportunity. This is a bigger reflection of black America because I live in a predominantly black community. And I want the same thing for black America. I want us to have opportunity. And not opportunity as a seat at the table, but opportunity in who we are, in our culture, in our lens. Whereas most achievable and attainable for all of us. So when I speak to a lot of my, you know, when I speak to a lot of the funders I sometimes talk to or whatever, what I say is get out the way and give us the assets because it's enough of them that mess everything up. You know, for years we had a half built jail across the street from an NFL stadium. That could have been all money given to our community you know, to do something just as stupid or as smart. It's not about what comes from the opportunity. It's about giving the opportunity and stop with all of the, you know, financial management, planning, and you got to put something on paper. Nope. Give it to us how we receive things best. Get it to us directly. And then let's see what we can creatively come up with. Because I definitely think every time black people get the opportunity to do something creative, the world benefits from it. Because as much as I was talking about the industrial age at one point in time being the key thing coming out of America in Detroit, black creativity is the, and I argue this, black creativity and black culture is the predominant export for everything in America. Because we signature and make everything cool. And that's why hip hop is where hip hop is. I hear that. Um, what do you have coming up? What are your next activities, big things? What's on the table for Detroit is different and creative difference, Inc.? Okay, so we're doing this event. I don't know if this will be before or after, but we're doing this. My mom's my first fan event. It's a community event for the NFL draft. I feel that if something comes to Detroit, it should have a black expression. Back to like, Who's going to value what our voice is? Hence, I got to create things to show people this is what we need to do instead of just being on a soapbox complaining always. So my mom's my first fan is an event where NFL pro moms will have a panel discussion talking to all the Detroit football moms. So on the panel discussion will be uh, Gwendolyn Mia. That's the mother of uh, Collett Hill that dealt with some injuries in the NFL, but uh, Heck of a start at University of Michigan. Uh, also, Gladys Bettis, uh, the mother of Jerome Bettis, uh, Tracy Robinson, the mother of Allen Robinson II, and uh, Constance uh, Davis, who's the mother of Spice Adams. And there'll be some other moms that'll be there. And along with that, it'll be a resource hub. That's going to be Sunday, April 21st. You can sign up through Eventbrite. It's a free event, community event. A lot of other resources will be there. Uh, I've partnered with Herman Moore, Legendary Lions receiver for this event as well, and his team 84. So that's going to be big. Uh, After that event, steamrolling into the collard green cook-off back to like black culture we love collard greens and i'm like let's just make something that's really cool and unique for our people and that's another thing with detroit is different events i sometimes think that um back to that same concept of opportunity you know blackness sometimes always needs agency to something so like you got to be black and christian or a part of a church or black and muslim and a part of a mosque or black and a part of this divine nine organization or black and from this gang or black in this michael michael motorcycle club or black and something else or whereas, this mason lodge yeah so <laughs> whereas detroit is different i just want to bring in our community all together so hence collard greens is one of those clarion calls to action that most black people we connect to it you know whether wherever you are degree no degree or whatever we want to value people for just blackness alone 
So the collard green cook-off is going to be two rounds this time. We got like a playoff round June 15th. Uh, Darius Twyman, for those that like the faith and the gospel, uh, he was at, uh, let's see, what was it? Uh, he, you know, heck of a gospel singer. He'll be performing. Uh, it'll be a part of Juneteenth Jubilee, uh, Joseph Walker Williams Center. Uh, and from four to six, right there, you'll be able to taste some collard greens and pick the people that will be the five finalists that'll go against our Buddha, our Chef Buddha that won the collard green cook-off last year. The okay. competition will take place August 15th. Uh, after that, it looks like August 25th. This is brand new. It's back to like clients that want to try something new. At Bailey Park, it looks like we're going to do a family fashion show where whole families will be a part of the fashion show. So, you know, uh, and what else? We'll do the My Natural Hair Show. It's always the last Saturday in October. We're going to do some more events here. Juneteenth, I forgot that. The actual Juneteenth at the Detroit Center. We'll be doing a screening of A Debt Old. Uh, not a handout. It's a video essay that I produced for the reparations task force. We're also going to do something real heavy the week after the election. We're going to do an event here. Uh, is Detroit ready for a black woman mayor? I think that's going to be real hot. I think that's going to be hot. And um, we're going to do something for this 10 year anniversary of Detroit is different too. Oh, cool. Well, we're going to transition to what we call our lightning round. Okay. And this is where we ask you a few questions about your engagement with the city and how you get along or how you see the city. And the first question is, what's your Coney order? Coney order, uh, grilled chicken pita, uh, no tomatoes. I want a side of ranch and make sure that my fries are well done and pink lemonade. Okay. Who's your favorite Detroit athlete? Ooh, ooh, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. So when you say that, do you mean from Detroit or do you mean played? Played in Detroit. Yeah. Oh, Isaiah Thomas, okay. pound for pound. All right. Verners or Canada Dry? Mm, see, that's a trick one because, I mean, the Detroiter would say Verners, but I'm going to say Canada Dry because I don't know. It's like that that hint with Verners. But in a Boston cooler, Verners. Okay. Better made or Lay's? Oh, man, that's easy. Better made. Okay. Barbecue. Uh, deep dish or pan style pizza? Oh, man, that's easy too. Deep dish, but Detroit style, not that Chicago the square, style. The square one. Yeah, yeah, buddies. We got to fix that question. Uh, favorite Motown artist? Hmm. So the label Motown. Yes. Okay. Man, that's a tough one because I like so much stuff in Motown and it goes in iterations. But right now, it's Gladys Knight. I don't know why. It's like I've been listening to a whole lot of Gladys Knight recently. Uh, maybe because um, uh, Use My Imagination is her version is really cool. But I love that blues too. So you know. I think Gladys Knight is underrated. I think she underrated on Motown. I oh, yeah. She got all the love she deserves. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah, I know. Uh, Favorite place to go in the city? Hmm. Okay. So, Belle Isle is just a natural, immediate answer. Mm -hmm. But in reality, I love my neighborhood. So, like, being on the block is always fun for me. I love it. I love it. Uh, favorite Detroit sports team? You already know. Like, I'm going to give an error. It's definitely the Pistons, and it's going to be the Rick Mahorn Pistons. Bad so, boy. Yeah, it's definitely that. Okay. Last question is, where can we find you? Oh, Detroit is different. Go to DetroitIsDifferent.com or just Google it. It's like all the socials and stuff like that. Or pull up on the block. I mean, I do stuff right next to where I stay. I got footprints of lots of land where we do gardening and events and stuff like that. I mean, I'm easy to find. All right. Cool. Well, you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Kyrie Frazier, Detroit is Different, Creative Differences, Inc. Uh, brother is a big booster of the city. Uh we're going to be collaborating, doing a lot of stuff mm -hmm. together. Very excited for that. Uh, he invited me for my first podcast interview <laughs> off, off this set. Uh, thank you for that. And thank mm -hmm. you for your time coming in today. Thank Appreciate you. you. Yes, sir. Yep. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching. Uh, this has been the Distinctly Detroit podcast. You can find us anywhere you get your pods. Please like, rate, and subscribe. And we'll see you next time. This has been the Distinctly Detroit podcast. This is a production of the University of Michigan Detroit Center. You can find us anywhere you get your pods. Please like, subscribe, and rate us. This podcast is executive produced by Marlon Franklin, edited by Aranza Stanton, and written by Shaylin Jones and Fiota Ship III.